Hi there, I'm Ken Everett from Digital Matter. I'm here today to talk to you about indoor and outdoor tracking using Semtech's latest LR1110 uh, chipset. The use case that we're trying to address is where we get asked quite a lot by customers. They want to track assets that are moving both indoors and outdoors, and they want reasonable level accuracy in terms of where these assets might be. So you can imagine assets that are going in and out of warehouses that might be being loaded onto trucks, moved around, going inside buildings, hospitals with medical equipment, uh, there's, there's quite a long list. The customers also are asking for long battery life. Right? So they ideally want to be able to deploy the asset and never have to uh, touch the device on it again for the life of the asset. The device is also really needs to be small, rugged, easy to install. Uh, pretty straightforward, but not that easy to achieve actually. Uh, what we are doing is announcing this week the new Yabby Edge device and it coincides with the Things Conference. This new device uses Semtec's LI1110 chip um, and we'll get into the details during this presentation. That's what it's really about. But the device uses both um, GNSS scanning using GPS and Beido and Wi-Fi scanning for location. So it'll work both indoors and outdoors. Um, it's LoRaWAN support for all regions. We're getting great battery life off this device and it's coming at an aggressive price point and we'll be announcing more details on pricing uh, a bit later. So today we're going to dive into the details a bit so that you understand a bit more about Semtex's LI1110 chip that's on this device. Whether you're going to use it yourself in your own uh, devices potentially or you're going to be buying devices from us, it's good to understand how it works so you, uh, you know what's going on. So what the LI1110 brings us is a, a great LoRa radio transceiver. Uh, it's got a GNSS scanner in there. So what that is doing is receiving GPS and Beto signals and being able to uh, record that information. And it's got a Wi-Fi scanner. So where we talk about a scanner like that, it's passive. So it's not doing Wi-Fi probing to get access points. It's just receiving data. So the GNSS and Wi-Fi scan data is collected on the device and it's packaged up and it's sent up into the cloud. And the cloud is used to resolve that information into a location. So the device itself doesn't actually know the location uh, when it gathers this information. Semtech provides us with a cloud API and there, there are fees uh, associated with that. So typically to do a GNSS scan on the device, it takes about eight seconds. Uh, we're getting satellite data and timing information from about these satellites. And typically that size of that data is anywhere from 35 to 50 bytes roughly. A Wi-Fi scan is passive and takes about three seconds. The information we get back from that is a list of access points and the signal strength coming from those access points. Uh, and depending on the number of access points, that data size can any be anywhere between 28 and over 100 bytes. So Digital Matter, I like to um, bang into the engineering team that the devil is in the details, right? And that's really where our engineering comes into play. We we do a deep dive into how this stuff works and make sure that our devices perform properly. So I'm going to talk through some of the, the issues and the pros and cons, I guess, of some of the, the things that we're using the LR1110 for. So first up, the 1110 needs a lot of external components, right? In this case, approximately 50. A lot of that is RF matching, there's passives, there's timing. It also needs an external micro to actually talk to it and manage it. Um, so yeah, not as simple as just dropping a chip on a PCB. And here's a, a picture of uh, the PCB from our Yabby Edge device. So secondly, the GNSS scan and the Wi-Fi scan are definitely lower power than what I would call a full uh, GPS. So one of our traditional GNSS devices are using a U-Blox EVA M8Q on there. Um, but there's a few gotchas that you need to be aware of, right? So the scan data is relatively large considering that we need to upload this information via LoRaWAN. So depending on um, the LoRaWAN network, uh, the region that you're in, the spreading factor, the data rates, you know, you could be on 11 byte messages, right? And you have to need to send up this combined GNSS and Wi-Fi scan that could easily be over 100 bytes in size. So there's a, there's a definite complexity here that needs to be managed. So the protocol that the, the device is using to send the information up to the server needs to cater for multiple messages in the uplink. And obviously complexity is introduced with that, right? The packets or the messages need to be reassembled so that the payload can be reassembled on the server side. You've got to cater for possible message loss in that, not to mention the power that's required from the device to actually send these multiple messages up. The flip side is that it requires the server side solver. So, um, there's obviously complexity on the server in terms of receiving all this information. There's an ongoing cost uh, that you're going to be paying to, to Semtech to resolve this information every month. 
Um, and that's the complexity of the pipeline. Really, there's work to be done on the server to get this right. So thirdly, the Genesis scan sensitivity is something that uh, is worth noting, right? Just because it has a Genesis scanner in there doesn't mean that it's going to work perfectly under all conditions. So the, the data sheet tells us that the scan sensitivity is minus 134 dBm or minus 141 dBm with an Almanac file, and we'll get into that detail a little bit later. The Genesis scan needs five satellites minimum, depending on the constellation, so whether it's GPS only or GPS and Baidu. So the detail of this and why it's important to know is that this receive sensitivity is, I don't want to say significantly, but it's worse than a, a full traditional GPS Genesis, where typically the cold starts sitting at minus 148 dBm, 150, minus 157 for a warm start, and even minus 167 in kind of a tracking mode. So th the bottom line is that using the LR1110, you're less likely to get a GNSS location when there's no clear view of the sky or ideal conditions. So imagine you've got um, assets that are inside or, or near buildings and the, the view of the sky is blocked by the buildings or they're, they're on pallets that are stacked. Um, you might find that the mounting location of where you're putting the device is you want to conceal it so it doesn't have a nice view of the sky. It might be, say, in the uh, glove box of a vehicle um, under the dashboard, it's, it's not initially getting a nice clear view of the sky. So in order to improve that, we really want to use uh, what Semtech allows to do is, is download an Almanac file and use that on the LI1110 to allow the, the uh, IC to have a better idea of which satellites are up there. And that, that improves the receive sensitivity to minus one for one dBm, which, which starts approaching you know, traditional GPS kind of performance. The downside of that is we need to manage this Almanac file and getting it down to the device. So it's a 2580 bytes. Uh, it's valid for three months, but it's recommended that you actually update the file monthly. Um, obviously, this requires a, num a bunch of LoRaWAN downlinks and effectively a file transfer down to the device that needs to be managed. The device also needs to know its approximate location within 150 kilometers roughly, and it needs an accurate time to be able to use this Almanac data. This also, you know, these sensitivity numbers assume that you've got a decent GNSS antenna design. And this is a whole art in itself in terms of designing PCBs bees that will perform uh, adequately when it comes to, to these types of things. Uh, on the right, you can see a picture of our Yabby Edge PCB, nice ceramic patch antenna, big ground plane, uh, and we feel that's a great trade-off of size versus performance in terms of what we get from this device. Um, all these things just need to be taken into account. Diving into some of these other details, it, it kind of probably... Um, follows that the server-side integration is more complex. So our current uh, GPS devices simply get a, a latitude, longitude, speed, and other information and send that up in a single LoRaWAN message. It's easy to parse and insert into the system. With the LI1110, the server is, needs to be a lot more intelligent. There's a lot more work to integrate this on the server side. So message fragment reassembly, including catering for missing messages. There's a workflow involved in terms of, do I look up GNSS first? Do I look up Wi-Fi first? Do I fall back to LoRa geolocation? Once I've done this lookup, I then need to forward this information to whatever system it needs to go into. As well as managing the downlinks for the uh, Almanac, the sister Genesis scan. So getting the Almanac file down to the unit and uh, updating the device in terms of its location and its time. So we've done quite a lot of work on our back end. Our OEM device server now includes a location engine extension which performs this for you if you want. Um, we also offer all of our integration documentation so you can do this work yourself if you'd like to. Our results uh, are, have so far have been pretty good. This is some of our preliminary testing that we've been doing. On the right there you can see the green, uh, light green is the actual position of the device when we're testing and the uh, darker green around it is the Genesis scan results that we were getting. And then the red is where we were located in our actual building and the red is some of the Wi-Fi scan uh, position information. So you can see some outliers, particularly on the Wi-Fi side, but actually really pretty good for uh, what it is. So our Yabby Edge device uses the LR1110. It's a great device for indoor outdoor tracking. We think it ticks the box in terms of performance, power, and price. Um, and in terms of battery life, we're now with two AAA batteries getting three years plus with quite aggressive tracking um, options. That's like typically 24 positions a day. Um, and the firmware does allow it to be smart in terms of only look, getting position updates when uh, the accelerometer tells us that the device has been moving. And over 10 years with only a couple of positions a day, which is quite phenomenal if you think about the size of that device. 
So we've announced this device for the Things Conference. Uh, we've got stock coming end of February. It'll be available in March. We provide full integration documentation so you can integrate this into your system or you have the option to use our digital matter location engine. So we're really excited about this. Um, we hope that you'll uh, try them out and give them a go. Data sheets and information are available shortly on our website. Uh, so take a trip to digitalmatter.com and have a look. Thank you very much for your time. Great to be with you. Cheers.